This lecture is part of the West Indian Soldier Heritage Project, carried out in partnership with the National Army Museum and the National Lottery Heritage Fund. The Nine Years' War King William's War in the Caribbean from 1688 to 1697 In 1688, England witnessed what was later called the Glorious Revolution, where the Catholic King, James II, was deposed by the largely Protestant country, and his Protestant daughter, Mary, and her husband William, Prince of Orange, were invited from the Netherlands to take the throne, which they assumed as the joint monarchs, Mary II and William III. This event, a crucial point in the development of the English constitution and political system, also had the effect of drawing England into a wider conflict that was occurring in Europe, which William had been fighting as a stadtholder of the Dutch Republic. The French king, Louis XIV, famously known as the Sun King, had dreams of expanding French control over the continent, and had worked for several years to that end through a combination of questionable legal methods and forcible annexation of neighbouring territories. Following his ascension to the throne of England, William signed a treaty with Emperor Ferdinand of the Holy Roman Empire on the 20th of December 1688, which united England, the Dutch Republic and the Archduchy of Austria and later Spain and the Duchy of Savoy, in a grand alliance against the French. Hence this conflict has been known to history as the War of the Grand Alliance, the War of the League of Augsburg, and, in the Americas, as King William's War. It is most simply known as the Nine Years' War, reflecting its duration. Louis tried to disrupt the English war effort by giving aid to the deposed James II to reclaim the throne, which led to conflicts in Ireland. He even tried unsuccessfully to incite a religious crusade to unite the Catholic nations of Europe to return James to the throne. As on many other occasions throughout history, the war in Europe spread also to the colonies in the Caribbean. The Allied territories faced superior French military power in the region. The French were able to make initial gains from the Grand Alliance with the capture of the Dutch island of St Eustatius in April 1689 and then succeeded in forcing the English off the shared island of St. Christopher, more popularly known as St. Kitts, two months later. Due to these French successes and the danger of the threat that he faced, Christopher Codrington, a West Indian planter, commander of the militia and governor of the Leeward Islands colony, requested aid from England. Although the immediate threat was to the Leeward Islands, Sir Timothy Thornhill, a major general in the Barbados militia and a wealthy planter, before St. Kitts fell, raised a regiment of 700 men who were paid for out of the Barbadian public purse. However, unbeknownst to Sir Timothy, St Kitts had capitulated before his departure from Barbados. Travelling to Antigua, he rendezvoused with Governor Codrington, who was not prepared to attack St Kitts before aid arrived from England. In the meanwhile, they resolved to launch their own expeditions against the French and aid islands that were under attack. Firstly, a small detachment of militia was sent to the island of Anguilla, which in November 1689 had been under attack from a combined force of French and Irish Catholics. The detachment, although unable to repel the attackers, were able to rescue many of the island's inhabitants and bring them safely to Antigua. Next, on the 13th of December 1689, Thornhill, commanding 300 men from Barbados and 200 men from Nevis, sailed to attack the island of St Bartholomew and it succeeded in forcing the enemy to capitulate within the space of four days. The following January, he attempted to conquer St. Martin, although this was only partially successful, as a French fleet appeared, forcing him to withdraw, but not before he had destroyed the principal fortifications on the island. Meanwhile, in England, a joint naval and army force was formed, but, due to various practical and administrative issues, it was heavily delayed, and did not depart until the 9th of March 1690. It was composed of 13 vessels under the command of Captain Lawrence Wright, carrying the Duke of Bolton's 2nd Regiment of Foot under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Henry Holt. The English fleet first arrived at Barbados in early May 1690, where it was forced to remain for the rest of the month due to great sickness amongst the men, before proceeding to Antigua to meet up with Colonel Codrington's forces. Codrington was to have overall command of the land forces during the campaign. He was, however, disappointed with the number of men that had arrived, believing that between the Leeward Islands militia, what remained of the Barbadian militia, and Holt's men, 
they had a landing force of only around 2,000, although later estimates placed the figure possibly as high as 3,000. A surprise attack was attempted on St Kitts on the 19th of June, but was disrupted when it was learned that the French had dug trenches to fortify the chosen landing site of Frigate Bay, and Codrington believed his force could not overcome these fortifications and establish a bridgehead. However, the next day an attack was launched on the French position at Frigate Bay, which the English force correctly assumed that the French would believe was nothing but a feint, and they would attempt to actually land somewhere else, given the events of the previous day. Whilst the main body attacked at Frigate Bay, Thornhill would go ashore with 500 men of the militia half a mile to the east, climb the 800 foot high hill and then drop down onto the French's western flank, opening a hole in their position. The plan was a total success and for the efforts of Thornhill and his men, the hill is to this day known as Sir Timothy's Hill or Thornhill's Hill. The French were thus pursued towards the town of Basterre, with half the force taking a high road in the mountains whilst the other pursued by the road at sea level. The latter path saw particularly hard fighting and many Antiguans, who comprised the majority of the sea road force, were lost. The French abandoned Basterre and fled into the mountains for a time before they descended and decided to mount a defence at Charles Fort at Sandy Point. The English were able to reconnoitre the fort from the nearby vantage point of Brimstone Hill and the hill also became the site of a gun battery using weapons brought ashore from the fleet. This marked the start of Brimstone Hill as a military installation and it would become St Kitts's main defensive fortification. These fortifications are now recognised by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site. Between the 2nd and 12th of July 1690, the English bombarded the fort and were able to slowly proceed to within pistol shot of its walls. On the 12th, a ceasefire was agreed, which was followed a few days later by a French surrender, with the garrison marching out of the fort on the 16th of July. Following the great success on St Kitts, Thornhill, in command of 350 men from both the local forces and Bolton's regiment, successfully managed to recapture the island of St Eustatius for their Dutch allies in the space of four days. This was a welcome final victory before the onset of the hurricane season. Later in the year, an attack on Guadeloupe was abandoned for a variety of reasons, including a lack of supplies, but also due to the sickness of the troops the reluctance of the West Indian militias to participate unless they got a full share of the plunder, but most importantly of all, deteriorating relations between Codrington and Wright. Thus, the next offensive operation did not take place until the following year. Troops were landed on the island of Marie Gallant on the 28th of March 1691, where the French had abandoned their fortifications and chosen to hide in the island's wooded interior, where the English had to flush them out, successfully. However, they chose not to leave a garrison and proceeded to Marie Glant's more strategically important neighbour, Guadeloupe. The English fleet arrived on the 19th of April 1691. However, there was difficulty in selecting a suitable landing site due to French defences near the principal town of Basterre, and thus the landing was not made until two days later near Anse Barque Bay. The march to Basterre had many trials through difficult terrain, including thick woods and deep gullies, which the French used to their defensive advantage. However, the English force pressed on with heavy losses, and Codrington arrived at La Belief, a mere three miles from Basterre, at sunset on the 22nd. The next day, a naval force was sent along the coast to reconnoitre Basterre. The town itself was found to be abandoned, and the French defenders had taken up position in the town's castle and accompanying fortifications. Bombardment from the sea proved impossible, so a land bombardment had to be attempted. However, word was received that the French had received reinforcements at Martinique, and in light of this, it was decided that the army would re-embark, which it did on the 14th of May, ending operations. Captain Wright left the Caribbean shortly afterwards, bringing an end to this expedition. Another expedition was attempted the following year, 1692, between the January and April, due to this failure to capture Guadeloupe. However, the land force sent only consisted of 400 men, and these were not used in battle, as the English fleet was unable to gain naval superiority over the French. Many of the men died of disease in Barbados, as did the expedition's commander, Captain Ralph Wren of the Royal Navy. Yet another expedition was thus launched the following year, under the command of Sir Francis Wheeler. This new force contained nearly 2,000 soldiers in addition to the Navy. Militia had also been again raised in the West Indies, with Barbados providing an extra 1,000 men, but the Antiguan militia refused to fight under anyone but their own commander, 
and thus Christopher Codrington was obliged to join the expedition as a volunteer commander. The initial target for this expedition was the island of Martinique, with troops from England landing at the beginning of April 1693 and beginning a series of raids. Codrington's West Indian force arrived on the 9th. On the 15th, the decision was taken to attack Fort Royal, modern-day Fort de France. Although the English advance parties were forced to retreat, the French themselves withdrew to the safety of the fort and the town. However, the initial attacks on Fort Royal failed, and a French counterattack resulted in many wounded. In light of the losses they had sustained since the initial landing through fighting and disease, it was decided on the 21st of April to withdraw from the island. The English force had lost 800 men since the landing, and their task remained incomplete. Codrington later explained the failure of the assault of Martinique as being begun at the wrong time, just before the start of the May rains, making sickness inevitable and hampering land operations. The naval squadron's orders to leave by the end of May only left two months for what he regarded as a four-month operation. Thus, this expedition was also unsuccessful. In 1694, a French attack on Jamaica in the aftermath of an earthquake caused widespread devastation. This led two regiments under the overall command of Colonel Luke Lillingston being dispatched to the region from England, a total of around 1,200 men, with the principal aim of recovering Jamaica if it had been captured, which it had not, and then attacking the French territory on Hispaniola. However, the fleet, under the overall command of Commodore Robert Wilmot of the Navy, did not arrive at the Allied territory of Spanish Hispaniola until the following year, due to the delay in communications and the delay in launching the expedition. Relations between Navy and Army were already at a low point by the time they arrived, despite the King personally impressing the importance of cooperation between Wilmot and Lillingston, in light of how poor relations between commanders of land and sea had negatively affected the previous expeditions, leading to both mistakes and delays. With the assistance of their Spanish allies, the attack began at Cap Francois, today's Cap Haitian, in March 1695, where the French unexpectedly abandoned and then blew up the local fort, pulling back to Port de Pay. The English army pursued, which required a 16-day march, which was originally only thought to last four days. Bad weather on the way negatively affected both men and morale. Time was also wasted by the arguing between Lillingston and Wilmot over the conduct of the campaign. When both land and sea forces finally arrived at Port de Pay, there were further disagreements over establishing gun batteries on shore to assail the fortifications leading to delays in landing the guns, and even when these were successfully landed, they were found to be of the wrong type and in the wrong place. A breach was eventually established, and an assault was being prepared when, on the night of the 3rd to the 4th of July, the French attempted a breakout, and many made it to the woods, where they were later captured by the English's Spanish allies. The English squadron left Hispaniola on the 17th of July, and landed on Jamaica a few days later. Lillingston's men were suffering from significant illness, which led to a suspension of operations for two months, which turned into a cancellation. This marked the end of the English expeditions to the Caribbean during the Nine Years' War. The Nine Years' War came to an end with the Peace of Ryswick. Both France and England retained control of their pre-war colonies, continuing for the time being to share St Kitts. However, Disputes over the inheritance of King Charles II of Spain, the last Habsburg monarch of that country, led to the War of the Spanish Succession, which would also see limited operations in the Caribbean. The experiences of the Nine Years' War in the Caribbean demonstrated the necessity for the cooperation between the Army and the Navy in an environment composed of over 7,000 islands for successful military operations. Also, the expeditions had a tendency to arrive too late in the year, near the beginning of the rainy season, when operations could not be practically carried out, limiting the efficiency of these endeavours. It perhaps also demonstrated a need for regular forces to be stationed in the region. Whilst the expeditions had failed to capture any major new territories from the French, they were nevertheless successful in recapturing territories that the French had invaded, and perhaps in limiting French ambitions. The conflict showed that the West Indians could take an active and valuable part in their own defence, as well as offensive operations, as would become more apparent with the advent of the 18th century. For more information about this topic, as well as the history and heritage of the Caribbean and the work of the West India Committee, please visit us at westindiacommittee.org. Thank you.